please everyone join me in welcoming back to the stage the director, Daniel Rohr, and producer, Diane Becker of Navalny. I want to first let everyone know that we will be taking questions from the audience tonight, uh, too. So there'll be red coats floating around with microphones. Please just raise your hands, and they'll make their way to you. Um, I'm sure many of you have questions, but I'm, I'm going to start with my own, if you don't mind. Um, Daniel, this, so I first watched the film in early February. Um, now watching the film, especially the end of the film, has a very different meaning, not only with the tragedy um, that is happening in Ukraine, but obviously what's most recently happened with Alexei. For those of the audience that don't know exactly what has happened recently with Alexei, can you fill them in and, and let us know any other updates that you know of at this time? Absolutely. Um, but before I answer your question, I just want to remind everybody that making a film like this is a team effort. It really takes a village and you have myself and Diane here today, but we have a, a producing team that is Shane Boris, Odessa Ray, and Melanie Miller, who are not here right now. And then I also just want to mention the editorial team on this film in Langdon Page and Maya Daisy Hawk. And these men and women helped me, empowered me. We all work together to craft this film. Speaking to where Alexei is right now, he's in peril. He's in a really bad spot. Last week, Alexei was sentenced to an additional nine years in prison. His total sentence now is close to 12 years or something like this. The prosecution is appealing this because they want him to be put away for longer. It's important that we're mindful that this trial and, and this is nothing but political theater. There is no rule of law in Russia. There is no judicial system in Russia. It's more akin to a mafia state. And the regime will make up accusations. They have a laundry list, a menu of various made up fabricated crimes that they can rely upon to make sure Alexei is silenced, to put him away for as many years as they need to. It wasn't uh, unsurprising that this would be the result. I think he understood this when he went back. But it's still, I think, psychologically challenging to wrap your head around the situation, especially for his wife, Yulia, and their children. I'd like to find out from you, Diane, too, how you got involved in this project, and if the two of you can talk a bit about your unprecedented access uh, to Alexei and, and his family and, and what that was like. I'll let Daniel talk about the, the access, but, um, you know, Daniel, Odessa, Shane, Mel, and I um, met in early 2020, um, and we were developing another project, and um, we sent Daniel and Odessa to Europe to do some interviews and some research, and during that time, they met Christo Grozev um, and went off to do research on something else, and then a few weeks later called and was like, well, Christo thinks he might know who poisoned Alexei, and you know, um, we might be following that story. And then they disappeared for a number of weeks and emerged. Um, towards the end of 2020, and then we all were sort of barreling forward um, when Alexei got on the plane in January, and then barreled forward all year just trying to get the movie done as quickly as possible. Can you talk a little bit about your access to Alexei and, and, and how you ended up gaining his trust to be included in some of these pretty monumental <laughs> periods of his, of his life? I remember the first time I, I met Alexei Navalny was November 14th, 2020. Christo, uh, our Bulgarian nerd with a laptop, and Odessa, uh, one of the producers of our film, we drove across Germany to this small sleepy town in the Black Forest to meet with Alexei and Maria. 
his chief investigator who you met in the film. And I, I'm not typically someone who is nervous around people or starstruck or anything like this, but Alexei had a presence. This was the man who lived in a real way, but he was disarming. He had this broad smile and these, these movie star good looks, and he was funny just as he is in the film and very engaging. And you like him immediately. And in that first discussion, my pitch to him was simple. It was like, listen, we're here. What's going on now is, is history in the making. We owe it to history just to start filming. Who we, I don't know if, if a film is going to get made or what's going to happen, but let's just start filming. And incrementally, we built on that premise of let's just start shooting. Um, and I think in the first few days, he sort of understood that, that my energy, which I brought to the table, was this relentless drive. And, uh, you know, Alexei uh, later said, he was like, yes, Daniel, very nice guy, kind of hyperactive, <laughs> but he will do a good job with the film. <laughs> and that's really sort of sums up my energy in a real way for people who know me. And Alexei understood, I think, that that's what it takes to, to, to make a film like this. Um, and so after that first meeting, we agreed that we would just start shooting a little bit. And the next day, he took me for a walk with his wife, Yulia, and introduced me to his friends, Donkey and Pony. <laughs> and I understood at that moment that this man was an extraordinary subject, unique, funny, charming, complicated, charismatic, and had the makings of a, a really unique uh, subject for a film. Mm. The scenes in which you interview him, um, are really incredible, and I, I kept thinking the first time I watched the film, the unique way that you framed him for the interview, and center frame, he almost has a presidential um, viewpoint in, in that part. Is that, at what point of the process did you sit down with him for to shoot that interview? And I, I love the scene too where Maria checks in with him to make sure that he's okay with everything, and um, I love that you were able to include that in the film. Can you talk about um, filming the sit-down interview with him too? So the sit-down interview was, was, was a really interesting challenge because I understood that it could very well be the last time this man, this guy, husband, father, political figure, it might be the last time that he's interviewed ever. And the weight of that was, was present throughout the experience of filming that interview. And he would roll his eyes, as he does in the beginning and at end of the movie, at me for asking him to think about the possibility of his own death. But we shot that interview just before he went back. I think we shot it the 11th, 12th, 13th of January, 2021, and he flew back on the 17th. And so this unknowingness, this step into darkness that this man, who I grew to care a great deal about, was going to take was sort of present throughout this interview. And it was very important to me to film it in a way that, that was befitting of the moment. And we, I, I lost sleep trying to figure out where we should shoot it, where we could shoot, do it on, in a studio, where, like what kind of space would be befitting of this moment. And I said to Maria, I asked her, his chief investigator, who's known the man for 12 years, I said, where is he is most comfortable? And she goes, he loves sitting in bars. So we found this bar, and I walked into this space, and I found this shot with the counter uh, in, in the foreground, so he can lean. I like when subjects can lean on a table. You can see their hands. And it sort of had this quality of sitting across from someone and just sharing a beer with them. And I think that was so befitting of who Navalny is. He's a man of the people in the truest sense, and he's the type of guy you would just want to sit ac across the bar from and swap stories with. And that's, that, I think, we really did a great job capturing that energy. So thank you for that. I'm going to pause now and see if there's any questions from the audience yet. I have a question back here. I'm curious. Whoops. Am I on? I'm, I've read, I think we've read several times that his health is very bad and that they keep trying to, to get the authorities to give him medical attention. Do you think he'll actually live a whole lot longer? I do. Okay. It's tough to work 
on a story like this because it's emotionally very difficult. This is a guy who, whilst I simultaneously must maintain a critical eye towards, I'm making a film about him, um, you can't help it but feel close to him, feel, feel his warmth and his presence. So I care about him deeply. And when you work with Navalny, when you spend enough time around him, you can't help but feel inspired by his sense of optimism in the face of vast forces and vast darkness. And so as I assess the landscape now that is his imprisonment, that is the situation he finds himself in, what I am struck by and what I think about is the man's ironclad spirit and character, strength and mental acuity. And so he's in a challenging spot. He survived a hunger strike, he's doing better, but he's still able to see his lawyers every day, remarkably. He's still able, via his lawyers, able to get messages out into the world. In fact, just today, he had a, a lengthy 12-piece Twitter thread about the war crimes being committed in Ukraine. So as much as he is able, he is engaging with the world and he is being present. Um, and I think everyone who knows the man is, is grateful for that connectivity. And how about the rest of his team at this point? Are they still working in exile? Yeah, one thing that we didn't, I don't think we, we, we mentioned in the film is that uh, Alexei's team are considered now in Russia extremists. And what that means is that Al-Qaeda and ISIS are on the same legal footing as the Anti-Corruption Foundation. So if you work for Navalny, you're committing a crime. Because of this, all of his team members were forced to flee the country, flee from their f leave their families, leave their belongings, and reconstitute the organization in Vilnius, Lithuania. And so when we're talking about the bravery of Navalny, we must also remember the bravery of his staff, of his family, of his team, and the men and women who are persona non grata in their homes in, in Russia, in Moscow, in St. Petersburg. They've all had to flee. Maria, who you met in the film, is not allowed to go back to Russia, she'll be arrested. And it takes incredible sacrifice and courage to do that. They believe in this cause. And these men and women are extraordinarily brave. And, and speaking of bravery, I think Yulia is top on that list, of course. Is she, do, can you let us know where she is now? Did she, is she trying to stay in Russia with him or is she at risk of being arrested as well? I think Yulia is spending most of her time outside of Russia. Um, I, I don't want to comment on uh, the whereabouts of Alexei's family members, but, but they are doing everything they need to do to stay safe. And I, I will say, because it's been reported in the press, that Alexei's children are not in the country, which is something we're all grateful for. Absolutely. Next question, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. A very powerful, powerful film, very inspirational. You're to be commended for it. So my question is, is this. Um, the guy that's sitting in the Kremlin now, and I'm not gonna grace his name. <laughs> um, his popularity apparently is at about 65% right now. What would you attribute that to? 65, 70% rise in rising. In your opinion, what would you attribute that to? And then lastly, would you think because of this film and the wide distribution it might uh, receive and probably has received now, uh, does this guy pose a threat to you and your staff much like he did to Navalny? Thank you. Thank you for your question. So I'll address the first part of your question first having to do with opinion polls in, in Russia, domestic opinion polls. <laughs> I would take those with a grain of salt. I don't think we have independent agencies that are conducting these polls, and I don't think they can be relied upon. It's that simple. I believe, if I had to guess, um, the man who currently occupies the office we are speaking about uh, probably has maybe 25 to 33 percent of popular support in the country, and I think everyone else is just scared shitless, and there is no capacity for dissent. There is no way to voice opposition. We have seen small acts of protest against this egregious war over the last six or seven weeks. There was a one example of the brave woman who worked for the propaganda channel who stood behind the news anchor holding a sign that said, end this war. And that image 
went, went across the entire world. But beyond that, Russian opinion polls must not be uh, given too much thought. Um, the second part of your question was about my personal safety. Uh, people like to ask about that, and everyone uh, has to appreciate that when you spend time working with Navalny and his staff, your own aptitude and, and, and your own, I suppose, uh, tolerance uh, uh, for fear changes. I'm not scared. I, there, I, I, I'm very confident that there is no personal threat against me and my safety because I made this film. What I am anticipating and what we are all anticipating is character assassinations. We have already been featured on Russian state propaganda channels, our picture, our images, and they talk about how we are agents of the West, how we work for the CIA, and this <laughs> film was funded by the State Department. Um, that was personally offensive to me as a Canadian. <laughs> but I think that what, what, what that speaks to is just the level that these propagandists will go to discredit the film. Um, and we don't exactly know how that will increase or decrease as the film um, spreads throughout the world, but we're not afraid, and in, in the spirit of Alexei, we are not afraid, and we are ready to take this film wherever it needs to be. I don't think we'll be invited to the Moscow Film Festival, um, <laughs> but uh, we're, we're, very, we're very feeling good about our safety and everything like that. Thank you for your question. I think that I would refer you to what Alexei Navalny would say if he were here, and he would say, don't be inactive. There are things that we can all do. Inactive, don't be inactive. I, uh, in the context of the United States, it's very different than the context of uh, Russia, but certainly the rise of authoritarianism has been growing throughout the world. We look at the Arab Bolsonaro in Brazil, or we look at the, the administration that used to occupy the highest office in this country. Um, and Marie Le Pen is, is polling uh, uncomfortab uncomfortably well in France right now. And she r runs the right-wing party there. And I think what we all have to remember is that these types of uh, uh, people and political organizations are able to succeed when good people do nothing. And what that means is everyone has agency to to do something. In this case, if it's a question of Alexei and helping him, his foundation needs support. People can make a donation, for example. Tell people to watch this film. It helps Alexei by keeping his name in the global consciousness. This film, in a way, I believe, can be almost like a, a life insurance policy for him. Everyone needs to see it. So one small act everyone can do is tell their friends, tell your neighbors to watch it and find it. It will be widely available. It'll be in theaters um, on the 11th and 12th of April. Um, 800 cinemas. <laughs> oh, die, get in there. And we'll be announcing when it will be streaming soon, very soon, on uh, CNN and on HBO Max. It, it'll be at Cedar Lee on Monday, April 11th, um, starting then, too. So, yes. <laughs> I don't, I, it might not be on Fox News, but even in this sort of, this unique country with its wacky political situation, I think that this is a film that reaches across the aisle. Uh, I think this is a film for everybody. I would agree. I think we have time for another oh. question. Go Thank ahead. You. Thank yeah. you. So my question, 
I think the bravery of him returning is just beyond what most of us could ever imagine. How do you feel, though, if, if he had stayed on this side, could he have made an even bigger difference by staying on the other side and working? It's an excellent question, and it's something that I think everyone who has known Alexei and cares about him has thought a lot about. And at the end of the day, I, would, I think what Alexei would say if he were here is that he could not, he would not feel comfortable telling people, asking people to go protest, to put themselves at risk, sitting comfortably in Vilnius or Berlin or Vienna. He had to be the moral example. He had to be the moral, courageous leadership that his nation desperately needed. And what that meant was going home. I think he also understood the power of being a political prisoner, because there is power that comes with that. But more than anything, he was afraid that if he stayed away, if he stayed in the West, he would be yet another oppositionist who has fled. And that would be an unpalatable, unacceptable gift to the man in the Kremlin. <laughs> I have uh, one last question. Um, for you, Daniel, which is if you can talk a bit about what you feel your responsibility is as a filmmaker at this point and filmmakers in general at, at this time in our history. Uh, there's often talk about documentary filmmakers in particular not having a bias, um, not necessarily having to take one side or the other, but I, but I think that that is... Um, I, I recall a conversation that you had at Copenhagen recently that was, that was really incredible, and I, I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about your thoughts around that. This is something that might be controversial to some, but as a documentarian, of course I have a point of view. Of, cor of course I have uh, a very clear prerogative. Politics, some of the time, and certainly in this case, is right and wrong. There is a clear morality at play here. You are either on the side of democracy and freedom of expression and justice, or you are on the side of an authoritarian dictator who's murdering children en masse in Ukraine. <laughs> and so for me, th there, this question of objectivity I is not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in being critical. Alexei, as you saw in the film, have, has aspects and elements to his past that I challenge him on, that are worth litigating and discussing. But at the end of the day, I firmly believe that I can simultaneously uh, view this man with a critical lens and be skeptical of some of his policies and, and, and history, whilst understanding that his mission is just and demands our support. Well said. I want to thank you both so much for being here this evening, for sharing this film with us. I know that you have a very, very, very busy schedule. Um, you're off to Netherlands tomorrow to share the film there. And I also want to let everyone know, Diane is also a producer of two other films in the festival, On the Divide and White Rebel. Um, and I think that uh, we're just lucky to have you here. We hope that you're continuing to make and, and fund um, really incredible documentaries like this. Thank you all. And, and I'll just say, I'll stick around for a few minutes in the lobby. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah. Thank you so much for everyone. Have a good night. <laughs>